Hello everyone, Nadlabs here. Today we're going to be making this explosion effect in the Godot game engine version 3.2. And the way we're, it's not, I don't want to really call it an effect because it's not a visual effect. It's more of a implementing first principles in Godot kind of tutorial. And by the end of this tutorial, you'll also be able to understand why this graph over here, uh, assuming this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis, what this graph has anything to do with these explosions. So let's get started. So I went ahead and pre-populated the uh, scene with a couple static bodies on the side to make walls, floors, and roofs, right? I don't want these uh, uh, boxes to leave. And I went ahead as well and made a sprite for once. And I just wanted to show you a couple things. This might look a little confusing. Just give me one second. Uh, what you want to do, if you want to follow and understand this tutorial, is you want to open up a new Godot project and you want to make a rigid body and all you want to do is put this code in. And it basically says that whenever this function push is called, we're going to apply a central impulse. The reason it's a central impulse is because if the force is applied away from the center, then the uh, rigid body would start to rotate in ways unexpected. And it's easier if you just apply it from the center and let colliding bodies handle the rotation, if that makes sense. And you're just going to want to apply the force variable. Now, Although it's set to uh, vector 2.0 at the moment, uh, we'll be able to manipulate this later. I also went ahead and made a negative rigid body. And it's easier for me to just show you what that means. These red ones are negative rigid bodies, and they just mean that they're, um, they, they're attracted to the explosion uh, center rather than uh, repelled by it. So all you have to do is the exact same thing as the rigid body over here, but the only thing you have to do is put a negative force. Right, because that makes sense if it's a negative value of force, it gets attracted or it goes in the opposite way that the regular ones are going. So that's all you need for over there. Now you can see that I have a lot of rigid bodies in the scene and they're all hidden underneath this uh, regular node, not a node 2D, not node 3D, but just a regular node. And the reason I did this is because it makes it easier to loop over these within a, a for loop. You have to have them inside of a, a type node because it makes it, it just makes it a, a lot easier. And if you do not want to put your um, script on the main scene, you can also put it on this. I just realized this making the tutorial. I'm just going to get straight into explaining, but I'm going to give a more of a first principles explanation rather than a how to code explanation. So this is just for debugging. You don't need to uh, pay attention to this. What really matters is in the input because that's where all the uh, physics events are happening. Let me just zoom in. And all the code is on GitHub if you want to copy. So here we go. Now I'm going to explain the code. I'm going to explain all these variables over here when I get to them and what their use case is. But I'm just going to go from the top to the bottom, just like the uh, Python or GDScript interpreter goes. You don't need to copy these because I said that I, ha I put in a line and a collision. I put collision shapes just for debugging. You don't need them whatsoever. And uh, on that note, might want to enable them just for my sake and to help explain. But the way I thought of this tutorial or the way I thought the explosion would work is that every time we click and the way I define click is I went to project settings input map, right? I typed in click over here and I just said whenever it's a space bar or mouse button click, we're going to set particles emitting to true, right? This is just particles for the sake of uh, uh, graphics. But what we're really going to want to do is that for i, and this is just an integer, it just means a number in rigid dot get child count. And up above, I said that the node ridges is, rigids is actually just this regular node over here. It makes it much easier to loop through them for every single uh, rigid body inside of that node get child count. So from let's see how big is it? One, two. So for this specific example it's going to say for I in 11 and the way that the for loop works, it actually adds one every time the loop is finished. And so for I in 11, really, or whatever number you have, the only reason we have dot get child count is that it makes the code reusable and it makes it expandable. So you don't have to con continuously change and edit it. We're going to set up a couple variables for our ease of use, which is a rigid body child. So inside of the rigid node, we had children, which are rigid bodies. So the way we get access to those is that we just make a variable called rigid body child and it's going to be equal to rigid dot get child. If you're wondering where I'm getting these functions, it's inbuilt into the nodes themselves. If we go over here, we can see that under the base setting of a node, we, were, we have access to all these functions over here, right? And we're just making use of them 
to create these uh, physics effects. We're also going to get the position of the rigid. We're going to do colon vector2 and we're and that just specifies it as a vector2 so we don't get any bugs. And we're going to say rigid body child which we already defined as a variable dog global position. And if you if you're one who relies on uh, code autocomplete you can see that I didn't have any auto completion there but it still works and you have to understand Godot doesn't always show you what you can do with autocomplete you sometimes have to know what the node itself is and or what something else or whatever it is for example if I put a uh, for example if I put that there then maybe nope it still didn't show me whatever that's a learning opportunity right there so continuing on how do we get the force well we're going to actually pass in an argument, which is p the position of the rigid body, which we just said is the rigid body's position, right? Position of the rigid, uh, pause of ridge, which is just position of the rigid body, right? It, if you just read this line of code, it makes sense. And we're going to pass this global position vector two into the force finder, which is a function right down here, which is about 30 lines. We're going to pass down this uh, position, this vector two into the force finder, and we're going to manipulate this a special uh, value to find our force. Now right off the bat we're going to declare a couple of variables and I'll, I promise I'll explain each and every one of them. The var vec is just the force where we're going to return, right? If I scroll down we're just returning the vec, uh, vec which just means that whenever we call this function the value it will return is a vector 2 which is what we're going to manipulate throughout the entire code block. We're also going to have a reference to our global mouse position and these two come as a package, which is just a, which is just a vector two consistent of two of the same values. And this, th and this x value actually has to be pretty high in order for this, uh, for uh, explosion to work. This is the entire explosion in one line of code. Now, what does it mean? It means divider. So a vector two of five thousand by uh, five thousand comma five thousand divided by position of the region minus the mouse position. Now, if we go over here to the uh, if we go over here to paint. Oops, I did a little bit of drawing beforehand. If we go over here to paint, we can see that what does position of region minus position of mouse mean? It I like I explained in my joystick video, which you can uh, see right up in the corner. All I said was that we're going to have a rigid body and we're also going to have our mouse. And what that means, we're going to subtract their position. The way I explained this before is that the way Godot counts positions is from the top left of the screen itself. So whatever this vector two is, it's actually just a vector from top from the top left to wherever this rigid body is. And if we subtract them, we actually get the resultant, which is doing green, which is right in between these two. Right in between these two. And this vector two, which is this one right here is how we can determine the force. So the position of the rigid will be um, subtracted from what well, we will subtract the uh, mouse. And, and that's what we're after. We're, we're after this resultant in order to make the force directional as well as give it some proportion. Now I'm just going to uh, clear that to make it a little bit easier. And the, and the reason we're dividing it is because of the inverse square uh, we're going to make sure that the we're going to make sure that the force is equal to the inverse square and the reason we're doing this is because it gives a very natural feeling effect if we didn't do this i'll show you what happens we get a very weird movement in a sense that the closest objects experience the least force and the farthest objects experience the most force you can see here that i can barely lift this guy up or this block up, whereas these other blocks on the right are getting all the push. And that doesn't make sense in reality. The closer you are to an object, the more force you exert on it, the farther you are from it, the less of a force there is. So that's why we have to divide it. And that just boils down to basic first principles in physics. Now that we have, now that we, if we have a divide, a divider in there, which will make us follow this inverse square law, we're going, we get some sort of a pattern which looks like this, where we have the closest objects experience the most force and the, and the farthest ex uh, objects experiencing little to no force. But it's not perfect just yet. And when I was making this, I thought this was the line of code that I needed, but I, when I was looking at it more and more, I realized there was something wrong. I realized that I forgot to clamp the values because when I didn't have the values clamped, you can see that 
the closest you the closer you are to the object you can see that it just flies away because the force is so powerful that it just pushes static bodies and rig sorry rigid bodies outside of the static body because the way that works is that this you can see that those red dots actually showed it the way there it goes the way that it works is that if this is, was the rigid body the way that the force in Godot works is it works something along the lines of moving it over here and checking collisions and if nothing's there it keeps on applying that force but most of most times out of 10 you can see that the actual you can see that the force that isn't great enough to push it outside of this thick wall and after it is pushed out it falls it goes away forever and ever but m mostly it doesn't and the way to stop this is to clamp the values wherever the vector dot vec, vec dot x is greater than the greatest force we're just going to set it equal to the greatest force and same and if it's less than the negative greatest for greater greatest force just set it equal to that and that links to the beginning of the video where you saw this volcano shape the curve over here is very self-explanatory if you've ever seen an inverse uh inverse function which is just this or if you saw if you ever seen an uh, one over x squared if you haven't i encourage you to go watch some khan academy videos on this topic or go on to any sort of online graphing program and just type these in you'll see what i mean this is what this sort of slope shape is defined by but what are these flat uh flat lines over here well this block of code actually performs the flatness or it makes it flat if you want to call it because it just says if it's greater than this force right which it is just set it equal to a constant amount and that's essentially what that um flat line over here means but there's also another flat line over here and that comes in because of this over here i'm just actually going to just comment these lines out because i don't need them at the moment so as this comment over here suggests uh this block of code over here is just to ensure that the farthest object does not experience the most amount of force sorry no 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 this, this comment is actually wrong and i'll update it it just means that the farthest objects or objects outside of a margin will not experience any force whatsoever how do we accomplish this if the vec dot x is quite small and by quite small we mean less than 50 you can choose whatever you want i found 50 works the best if it's that small just set it equal to zero and vector uh 2.0 just means vector this is why i don't do live code tutorials vector 2.0 uh vector 2 um 0 comma 0 and that's all it means and we can do the exact same thing for the y margin but if you notice something we're not only doing it for the positive time or positive side we're also doing it for the negative side at the same time and that's because you want to make sure that your x value is actually really small on both sides for example if we have a number line over here oh no if we have a number line we want to make sure that our force does not work uh, within a certain range right we don't want we don't want it to work over here and we want to make sure that if it gets over here we do not want it to go oh. if the force does somehow reach a really high number we're going to make sure that it doesn't go past here we want to make sure that it's in a happy medium and that's kind of what we see over here if you if you just like if i just do this oops sorry for the light but if i just do something like that you can kind of see what i'm referring to i'm trying to get at at the i'm trying to get to the point that oops i thought i was using the line tool i'm trying to get to the point that we want to make sure oh, we want to make sure that there's a range in which this function can work and if it's outside that range do something to it like clamp its value or just set it to zero and that's basically all i have to say about this function please do not hesitate to reach out to me and yeah that concludes this video if anything doesn't make sense please please just comment it down below because i do i really want to make sure that everyone understands what happened here because this wasn't just a good tutorial this was also a way to think from first principles which is the most abstract form and just for a little bonus, I'm going to actually make my own. I'm actually going to use a sprite I made one. Hooray. Um, let me just edit that. And we can actually see how it looks. You can see that these look like crates. And you can even make a simple game with this, uh, like an explosion game or some sort of like 
making a tower game with the crates or what have you. And yeah, that concludes this tutorial. Thank you very much for watching. And if you're new around here, please subscribe. Anyway, have a great day. Oh, sorry, just one thing. Uh, you don't you don't need to actually use the uh line over here. I like the line over here, or you don't have to put these collision shapes. That's just for debugging to uh help. It was to help me make this actual thing. Anyway, that's that's the end of the video. Have a great day.